No. So you're the hotbed of the Midwest, congratulations. So we're not gonna have a lot of young people. We're not real diverse in the upper Midwest. And I'm sort of using the upper Midwest because it is a generic area that when people look at the United States, okay, look at that. So here's where you've got a major advantage. The number inside of every state is the year that that state right now looks like when the, to match up with the United States. Let me say that better. Wisconsin looks like the United States did in 1974 from a demographic and diversity point of view. Iowa, 1930. So it's not a cut in Iowa. I just, I just giving you the facts here. So Illinois, 2012. And then you start seeing what we're going to look like 40 years from now in California and Texas. Why does this matter? If I'm a person of color and I'm trying to figure out where it is I want to go, I'm not sure I want to go to 1930. I mean, I, I just, I don't think I want to go there no matter what but I sure as heck don't wanna go there for these reasons. And so people are making decisions. Where do I wanna go? Where do I wanna live? Well, I wanna go and I wanna live where there are other people who have similar histories to me, that look like me, that maybe have similar interests to me. That all makes a big difference. And so if you're looking at something like this, if you just read the headlines, not so much for Illinois, but for Iowa and for Wisconsin, we're not represented real well in some of this stuff. And so where do people decide to go? And this is, you know, becomes a problem. So you've got an advantage there. You've got a little bit of an advantage with Chicago in terms of we get some people to at least come in internationally, but we are not the hot spot. It's not the upper Midwest. That's not where people are going. They're going to different places if they're coming from somewhere else. And then domestically, it's the same thing. I have a legitimate excuse because I'm from Wisconsin. Our image is basically a 400 pound guy with his shirt off in 30 below zero weather with a wedge of cheese on top of his head and tall boys in both hands. And if I give this speech in Wisconsin, someone stands up and says, and what's wrong with that? Just so you know that we're on the map, if you're familiar with Wisconsin, Right at the base of the peninsula up there is Lake Winnebago and good sized lake and it shows up on most maps. But you just put out another one of the surveys where they had in essence, the drunkest counties in the United States of America. We have 72 counties in Wisconsin. And when you looked at the map, if you were one of the most drunk, you were dark blue. And then there was Lake Winnebago, which was kind of white, light blue. And there were people who thought one of our counties let them down because the other 72 were all in there. So we don't attract a lot of people, you know, there aren't kids in South Carolina and in New Mexico saying, hey, I cannot wait to go to the upper Midwest. When I see it, it's usually, it's usually a snowstorm or it's a tornado or whatever it is that they might, they might see. We're not a real hub, we're not a hub, especially for younger people. One of the rules of life is if I'm a 25 year old, where do I wanna go? I wanna go where the other 25 year olds are. And this is not where they're coming. Again, slight advantage in Chicago, a slight advantage in the Twin Cities, Madison a little bit at a smaller level, but they're going to the West Coast, they're going to Texas, they're going to Florida, they're going to the Carolinas, they're going to places where, you know, keep Austin weird, that's where I wanna go. I'm willing to go to Seattle to be the most overeducated, underpaid individual working as a barista, and I don't care. But that's what they're doing. So we're not getting them. We're getting old, and we're getting old really fast. We've got problems in these four states about how old we're getting, and no one's coming in to replace people. I'm a good old-fashioned baby boomer, and we're not going gently into our old age. We're replacing everything. I mean, everything. We're gonna be expensive and we're gonna need care. And there's not gonna be anybody here to take care of us or to pay the taxes. And we're gonna have some serious trouble. No one's really thinking about that either. And this is where it gets uncomfortable. because None of my business, but y'all aren't doing your job. <laughs> so for 49 of the last 50 years in the United States as a whole, 
We haven't even been reproducing at a hold even rate, which is about 2.1 kids per female. We've been down about 1.7, 1.8, 1.9. So we're not even holding even. And then you look at Wisconsin and Illinois and you know, Minnesota, we're even below that. So we're not even reproducing at a rate that's gonna hold. I know what you're asking, what's going on in North Dakota, South Dakota, and Nebraska? <laughs> There's nothing else to do. So, <clears throat> so that's the depressing part. But the depressing part really to sum it all up is people aren't moving here, people aren't having kids here, young people aren't staying here, that's pretty much the equation. And if all of those are negative, then there's your world of hurt. The other thing we have going on is this. So as I said, and it was escalated the last couple of years, whole bunch of folks who look like me got the heck out of Dodge and we took off. And now we're all being replaced by millennials. And one of the biggest, face, or biggest problems our companies are facing is we have a whole bunch of 30 year olds that now have to run everything. I had the benefit of watching other people above me screw up for 15 years before I had to go screw something up myself. They're having to screw it up on their own without getting to watch other people do it. That's a big deal for an awful lot of companies. Any Gen Xers in the room? Yeah. You were in charge for 18 months. <laughs> you did a hell of a job. Every Gen Xer has the right to be bitter because every baby boomer hung on way too long. Now these snot-nosed kids are coming up behind us telling us what to do. So this has all happened. And then you have the next generation, the Gen Zers represented by the goldfish. Anybody know the reason for the goldfish? Tension span. <laughs> if you've ever had a fishbowl, and you tap on the outside of the glass, you can hang on to that fish for about six or seven seconds. That's them. Now I say that in jest because I have the pleasure of working with a whole bunch of millennials who are the smartest, hardest working, most creative people that bring incredible skills to the job. But every generation beats the heck out of the one that's below it. They're gonna be the end of the world as we know. I'm part of the dope smoking, ponytailed, never gonna mount anything anti-war generation. And now we own everything, so, so there. But this matters too, um, in terms of how they operate, both the millennials and the Gen Zs, and we'll talk about that a little bit too. So this is what we went out and asked our companies, now getting to sort of the, okay, so what are we gonna do? We asked them to sort of describe to us how are they changing their candidate experience? How are they changing their employee experience? How are they becoming the employer of choice in their area? And then what are they doing in order to find people in a world where there just really aren't um, any people? So how is your candidate experience? In a nutshell, if you've got somebody looking for a job that's under the age of, I'll even say 40, and you've got a website where I have to click seven times to go get it, there's a video that's 14 minutes long of a bunch of guys who started a company in a garage 100 years ago. If there's a writable PDF somewhere, if for anywhere, for heaven's sake, it says fax in this form, <laughs> you are out of luck. This is their first encounter with you probably. And they wanna know if this is a cool, hipster, fun, diverse, interesting place to come work. And you get one shot at that. Because if they don't find you on the website, the other place they probably didn't find you is Instagram. And that's where they're going. They're on TikTok. We had an incredible, a company just did an incredible TikTok video for their company uh, during Women's, um, Women's Month, whatever it was, Women's Appreciation, Appreciation. History, thank you. Synapses during Women's History Month. And what they did was they took five or six of their women who did it on their own, all of whom had been promoted up through the company over the last 15 years, all of whom had different lives. Some, a couple of them had kids, a couple of them had outside interests, and they were able to, in about a 45 second video, 
show we have women that work here, we promote them regularly, and we let them balance their work and their life. And that's how they're recruiting young women to try to come in to be a part of their company. It's clever. They weren't on Tic Tac. Tic Tac. <laughs> Generational differences. I know Tic Tacs. I know nothing of Tic Tac. So they're trying to reach them where they are. They're on Instagram. That's where they are. So if I want to reach them, that's where I have to be. And then they'll think, oh, this company knows what's going on. So if that process is difficult, if there's the duplication, I don't know if anybody's applied for a job lately, and don't raise your hand, I don't want to get anybody in trouble. But these easy applications where, I mean, you literally, you hit the easy button, and all you have to do is like upload your resume, and it fills everything in. There's no second cover letter. There's no fill out this form. There's none of that. You're done. Because what you're trying to do is get as many people into that funnel as possible, and you can kick them out later. But we got to get them first, and we got to make it really easy for them. And so they're trying to do things like that. So no duplication. Is your marketing department writing, writing all of your job descriptions? Because they should be. Because if it's 55 bullet points of a bunch of nonsense, they're not going to make it. But if you're selling what an exciting company you are and the cool stuff that you do and how you're high tech, but then don't have a picture of a Commodore 64 in the background. So we got to you know, work on the pictures too. But we got to make this really easy. It's an Amazon world. I mean, we just have to accept that. So they want to know when's the interview, when's the next interview, when's the decision making. They want to be able to track their progress in your decision to hire somebody. We get mad when they don't show up for an interview. They get mad when we don't tell them what's going on. Oh, we'll call you next Friday. Okay, that was a month ago. So we got to make sure that they are involved and we're staying in touch with them and maybe we're sending them cookies or dropping them a note or whatever it might be. I've only been doing this speech for probably six months. And when I started, I said, boy, you better be done from first touch to hire in less than three weeks. And then it was less than two weeks. And now we have companies who are bringing people in, interviewing them, giving them a tour of the plant. And while they're having the tour of the plant, the committee is deciding whether to hire them. So when they get back, they can give them an offer. That, that's the time frame. Because if we know anything, when they're looking for a job, they're obviously looking. When you interview them, they're still looking. When you offer them the job, they're still looking. When you hire them, they're still looking. And six months later, they're still looking. And I don't think that that's a lack of loyalty. I don't think that's a lack of commitment. It's the world that they were brought up in. Nobody's staying with you for 30 years. And you can't be mad at that. And when they leave after three, they eight seconds. My gosh, if they were there with you for nine, you should be happy. It's a different world. And we got to start adjusting to those things. And we've got to meet them where they're at. Is the process utilizing technology? Again, this is their impression, right, wrong, or indifferent. That process is going to tell them what century you're operating in. And so we got to make sure that we're putting our best foot forward. Are your interviewers prepared for today's 25-year-old? Because they ask different questions. First one will be, can I work remote? Well, you're going to operate a $7 million piece of equipment that weighs 12 tons. Yeah, but I can just take it home. They want the flexibility. They're going to ask for that no matter what. They're going to also ask about diversity. What's your plan? What are you thinking about? How do you bring different people into your organization? It matters to them. What's your social commitment? What do you do for the community? Those are all things that matter to them. So your interviewers better be paired when somebody says, what's the culture around here? They better have an answer for it. Because if they don't, you just told somebody something. So bottom line, I would say, if you haven't in your organization played the role of candidate, give it a whirl because I'll bet you you'll be willing to change about 15 things by the time you're done going through what you do. Because if it's taken us six weeks and the president has to interview the junior assistant marketing helper because they have to see everybody, so it delays us six weeks, you're not gonna find anybody. It's just gotta be quick. Companies aren't doing reference checks, they're changing their drug screening, their reference and background screening might still get done, but it's after hire because they can't wait for stuff. And they're not, you know, they're not checking references. I'm going to give you four names. And if I'm not smart enough to give you four names of people who are going to say nice things about me, then you probably figured out already I wasn't the right candidate. So they're just trying to do everything as quickly as possible. So then you get them through this candidate experience, and you do it quickly, and now you're trying to onboard them. 
Well, when we do orientation, no, how do we onboard them? Because this is another change that's taken place in this game. We got to figure out how to hang on to these people. We just fought for three weeks to find them. So now we can't bring them on and treat them like dirt. We're, we're ma making them feel special until we get them. And then we're like, okay, now you're just one of the rest of us. So now we got to figure out how we're going to treat them. What does that first day look like? What is the first week, the first month, the first year? Because we're constantly selling ourselves. It's no longer, you know, you're lucky to work here. It's now you're lucky to have me. And that hurts people to think about stuff like that, but it's, they can go wherever they want and they have proven that they will go. And so we've got to figure out how to deal with a lot of those things. So this isn't your um, orientation where we're filling out the six inch binders and getting all the healthcare and all that kind of stuff. We have to do that. But if they spend the first two days with their head in a three ring binder, trying to figure out you know, what to do, that's not a good experience. But if that first day consists of, hey, come on in, we've got the team, you're gonna be working together, we got some coffee, we're just gonna talk about what we're working on right now. And for lunch, you're gonna go out with the vice president of our area and she's gonna to talk to you about you know, what our plans are. In the afternoon, we're gonna have a little game of, I don't know, hide and seek, where you're gonna run around the office and meet a whole bunch of different people. No, we'll come find you, seriously. And we're going to give you a bag of swag when you leave. You're going to have a mug and you're going to have a sweater and you're going to have all these other kinds of things. At the, bottom, at the end of the day, that person's going home to somebody, their partner, their husband, their wife, their dog, their mom, whoever it is. They're going to say, how was your first day of work? And their answer to that question is going to tell you whether they're going to be there tomorrow. And so we got to figure out how to, how to handle that. But we've got to do it in a way that then it's not done on day one. We got to continue to take care of them. We got to give them some professional development. We've got to give them a career ladder. We got to let them know where it is that they're going so that they want to stick around. So they have now become our baby and we got to figure out how to surround them so that they want to stay with us. That's more work. That's harder. Yep, it is. And that's where we're at. What's your employee experience? We've had all of these companies, several companies have had as their motto, customer is number one, which is a wonderful motto when you're serving people. I have no disagreement with it. But this pandemic has really taken a toll on people. And you're seeing all the stories on mental health issues and people promoting their EAPs and all that type of thing, because we ran people hard. And now we don't have people to replace them, so they're still running hard. So now you've got companies taking a real hard look internally to say, Maybe we need to treat our people like they're number one, because if we don't have our number one people, we don't have our number one customer. And so you're seeing a real shift in companies trying to take care of their people. You're seeing to keep them with you, these check-ins, stay reviews, three months, six months, nine months, 12 months. A company the other day said, you know, we tried to do that and none of our managers were participating. And we never get the information back. So we changed it to three questions. Have you ever thought about quitting? Why? And why didn't you? You want to learn something? You're going to learn. It. Now you better be ready for it because don't ask the question if you don't want to hear the answers. But if you say, have you ever thought about quitting? We've all had a bad day. That's not what this is about. This is about, I don't like the people I work with. The place is dangerous. Nobody communicates. I don't like my boss. That's the kind of stuff you're going to get when you're thinking about quitting. But you're still here. How come? Might be the exact same reasons, but on the positive side. And you might find out some things that are easily fixed. One company had a whole bunch of people complain that work started at eight, school started at 8.20. That's a pain. Okay, we'll start work at 8.30. All right, 50 people are happy. Not a big deal. But we didn't know, we didn't ask. So again, don't ask the question if you don't want to know the answer. Here's the biggest one that I've seen in the last six months and probably the most profound thing that I'll say, this is really big. It's not a benefit if I don't think it's a benefit. You know, we've never thought about that before until now. We're gonna give them healthcare, we're gonna give them some time off, we're gonna give them a salary, we're gonna give them some retirement. That's what everybody needs, simple. It's not what everybody needs. We can argue it's what everybody needs, but different people want different things. I have three kids. I have two emergency rooms named after me, I think. 
I want health care when they're young. Now they're gone and there's somebody else's problem. It's not as big of a deal to me. So it makes a difference to that person. I'm 25 years old. I'm a 25 year old male. Let's, I mean, I can just pick on myself. 25 year old male. I'll never get hurt. <laughs> I'll never do anything stupid. Double, huh? But I do have this $50,000 student loan that I'd like to get rid of. What matters to me? I would rather pay off my student loan and get free Netflix than have health care. I'm not saying it's the smartest decision. I'm just telling you that that's what's going to mean something to someone. At the very beginning, I had something up there that said, you know, the, the $6,000 to help with student loan, that you can offer somebody $60,000 as a starting engineer, or you can offer them $54,000 and will match your student um, loan payment for a year. You're going to spend the same amount of money, but one of them has this intrinsic, like, I can get out from underneath that student loan. They're getting the same amount. We're just distributing it differently, but it feels different. So what's a benefit to them, depending on where they are in their life? You can't do all of them. You can't be the highest paid and the best benefits and the most vacation time and the highest 401k. But if I'm looking for more mature seasoned people, maybe I'm offering an 8% match on my 401k. It'll get people's attention. Maybe they'll want to come for that. If I want to get 25-year-olds, I might offer student loan payments. So a lot of this, and you're going to see it again when we see some of the examples of what people have done, how do we fit our company, our job into somebody's lifestyle? That's basically what we're doing. How do we get them to work and still have a life in a way that they wanna do it? And I'll give you a couple of stories on that in just a minute. Flexibility in everything. I mean, where, when, how, all of those things are on the table. And even in manufacturing, in, a, in an area where I never thought people would change their shifts or whatever, no matter what happened, they're changing their shifts. Okay, we can run a shift from nine to three because people are dropping their kids off at school and then they have to go get them. That's what we're going to do. We had a company that was running five eight hour days. They asked the people, would you rather have five eights, four tens, or three twelves with a little extra? All of them wanted three twelves. It's a group of people that love snowmobiling, ATVs, fishing, hunting, all the stuff that typical Northern Wisconsin, to be honest. They got a four day weekend out of the deal. That's hard to replace. They're not gonna leave because that's a pretty good benefit. They're fitting into the lifestyle of those people. And then treat them well, cause they'll be back. I saw a statistic, I, know, I think it was one of the Sherm groups that said 50% of the people within two weeks regret leaving where they were. Whether or not they're coming back, I don't know. But we can't kick them on the way out. And then, you know, are you an employer of choice? So the employer of choice used to be really easy. We pay the most money. We're the employer of choice in our community. It wasn't that hard. Now people are looking for some different things. Especially with the younger folks, they're looking for sort of a whole different environment. They want this job to be a reflection of them. They want information, they want transparency, they want social justice, they want to be engaged, they want to be involved, they want to know what's happening, they want all of those things. That's beginning to make people more of an employer of choice. Is there a community? Is there some diversity? All of those things matter. So then the big part, okay, so all of this is going on. People are still saying, yep, we're, we're starting a third shift, we're building a new plant, we're doing all of these different things. So okay, where are we going to go find people? This has all happened within four, five, six years. And a ton of it has happened within 18 months because we sort of have seen this thing coming. A really smart demographer said to me once, if someone is born today in 18 years, they'll be 18 years old. You can quote me on that one. We have known this has been coming for a very long time. And we almost got scared in about 2007, 2008, like, uh-oh, look at all the white haired guys out there. Now what? And then we had a little bit of a recession. Everybody said, ah, no problem. And then we came back. And son of a gun, if the white haired guys now weren't bald, and now we're really in trouble. And so we knew that it was coming and we kept saying, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Well, now it's here. And so now we're trying to figure out, okay, what is it that we're going to do? 
So if we're playing poker, I would argue this is the ante. This is basically what everybody's doing. I don't mean everybody, but almost everybody in terms of trying to find people. They're using these as like, okay, these things have to happen because if we're not doing this, we're in trouble. Some of these have had consequences. I mentioned the offering bonuses. We had a company in Southeast Wisconsin, $8,000 signing bonus. If you signed up by the end of August and you were still there on December 31st, $8,000 for five months. Cool, okay, that'll bring some people in. What about all the people that started in July and June and May? I'm them, I quit, I come back. But it's causing all this wage compression now because now all of a sudden, hey, our lowest wage was 15. You know, that person across the street paid him 16. Andy paid him 17. Amy paid him 18. I'm gonna get him back again for 19. I got the same bad employee back and I'm paying him five. But that, you know, that's what's happening out there. And it's compressing wages because if the bottom wage went from 15 to 19, well, then 17 has to go to 21 and 19 has to go to 23. And pretty soon we're spending a lot of money and we're not getting better talent. We're not getting better, more productive. We're just paying a lot more money for what's going on. And some can say that's good. Got people making a living wage and that's wonderful. But at some point, there's a lot of companies who can't, literally cannot increase everybody by $5 an hour because they're not gonna be able to make it. So some of these things have been really good um, and some have caused a whole nother set of problems. So we do all those things because we have to. Now we get into the, all right, how do we fit everybody in to sort of this work-life balance? The freelancers, at the, one of the early slides it said, I think it was like 13 million, of, 13 million people said, I'm out, I'm doing the gig thing. I'm just gonna figure out, I'm gonna be my own boss. I don't wanna work with this nonsense anymore. So they went out and did whatever they wanted to do. So now instead of our company saying, hey, we're looking for two marketing assistants, we might say, we're looking for a graphic design, communications, public relations. We're looking for some skills. And it might be six people that fill the two jobs instead of two full-time people. That's more work, that's a bigger hassle. I'd rather just have two good people, but I might not find two full-time people. I might find six or five or three part-time people. So we gotta look at it completely different. And then we have to write our job descriptions in a way that we didn't just eliminate 13 million people from coming to work for us. So they're looking at it a little bit differently with the people that are out there doing the gig thing. Hiring people um, in prison. Yeah, you know, I'm guessing you have worked with some, some companies that have done that, but folks that have been incarcerated, whole bunch of different reasons, but it's a group of people that unless something dramatically changes in their life when they get out, they're probably going back. And one of the ways to change that is a really good job. And I will say in the upper Midwest, the connections between um, the departments of workforce development and the departments of corrections have done some pretty amazing things. And so people are literally getting trained while they're incarcerated and people are hiring. We have companies that that is their talent supply chain, that people will call them and say, I'm getting out May 15th, I've gotten certified in, I'm a welder now, I'm a CNC operator, whatever it might be. And that's where they're going to look for folks. It's another opportunity. It's another their place. It's going to be a group that's going to have additional needs, probably, and additional support, but it's another group of people that companies are now starting to take a look at. The niche populations, and this goes back to the freelancers a little bit, but I, I have to look at my jobs now and my company and say, who wants to come work here? Who are we perfectly set up to accommodate? I gave you the example of the, the outdoorsman in northern Wisconsin. We had another company that childcare and transportation, those are the two big blockers. And so they said, can we take care of the childcare thing if instead of hiring five full-time people in our office, we hire 10 half-time people and get them to swap childcare? We do the buddy system. You take my kids while I'm working, I'll take your kids while you're working. We don't have to pay any childcare and we both have jobs now. And they did it. They set it up that way. Companies that are looking into childcare and saying, you know, we really don't wanna run our own, but can we partner with somebody that will, you know, give us a deal if we promise to send them 15 of our employees' kids? The child thing is a big deal. This was a big deal. This was um, Deloitte saying, you know what? There's a lot of primarily women because they're still the primary childcare um, provider. 
that are going to have their kids hit school age at some point. And when they do, they've got a window there that from nine to three, I got peace and quiet. And they may not want to work 70 hours, but they might want to go back to work. They're dependable. They've already got the education. They obviously are organized. They're mature. We should figure out if we can figure out something for them. And they did. And they had a group of people now that then they go out and talk about it. How did you manage to go back to work? Oh, my company's got this great program. I only have to do this and this, and I have to be there for these hours. And then I can come in on weekends to do some of the other stuff. And, and so they figured it out and they matched the lifestyle of the people that they were trying to accommodate. And so companies now are trying to figure out what can we offer that nobody else can, and then we can hang on to those people. One last one, construction company. What does a 26, 27 year old construction worker want more than anything else? A badass truck. A badass truck. You stay with us for a year, we will lease the truck. Once they get that truck, they're like, they're not leaving. They, that's not a cheap thing. And so they figured out this is what this lifestyle wants. This is what we're gonna give this lifestyle. That's how we'll hang on to those folks. Diversity in every way with the younger generations, whatever you wanna pick, they're looking for. It. And our area is not the most diverse. This is probably the most diverse audience I've probably spoken to. I mean, you get into Iowa, you get into middle of Wisconsin, there's not much there. And people wanna know, well, then what are you doing about it? What are you trying to do to create a diversity of ideas and a diversity of experiences? Because that's what they're looking for. They want the differences, they embrace the differences. And so companies that aren't doing that, that don't have their own DEI council, that aren't trying to figure out how to go find folks that maybe don't look like them, they're gonna be disappointed in that. And so if we're trying to get them, we've gotta make sure that we're selling everything that we're doing um, with our DEI work. People with disabilities or you know, people with disabilities who have great abilities. And you know, this quote um, from the woman that's the, the head of the National Organization of Disability, you know, I just, I just find it interesting. A lot of companies were doing this. A lot of companies were hiring people, but it was mostly altruistic reasons. It was like, yeah, that's the right thing to do. Let's go do it. But you do have people that have incredible abilities. And so how do we take the incredible abilities and make them work in our organization? Still a good thing to do. Now you're doing something that's productive for the company. It's productive for the individual. And so we figured out ways to bring people in. Might require more support. It might require more time but it's another group of people that folks are now looking at um, perhaps differently than they did before. All of people we just turn loose, 10,000 of us turn in 65 every day in the United States. Off we go, who knows where? Well, I know where. <laughs> They're either fishing or sitting out in a, a hunting shack or wherever we all went, but we just let them go. And one of the things that we're really looking at now is it's not so much the unemployed, it's the unengaged. Who left the workplace, but still actually might want to work, but they can't because of childcare, because of transportation, because they kind of kicked me out, because I just left, whatever it might be. So you have all the young folks who have um, FOMO, the fear of missing out. I've gotten to the point now, I have JOMO now. It's the joy of missing out. I don't want to go to budget meetings. I don't want to supervise people. I don't want to sit through some of the nonsense. I just want to go out. I want to go help people. I want to go do stuff. I want to do projects. A lot of these people can still do this and they can do it from almost anywhere. And it's a group of people that's got a lot of institutional knowledge. It's got a lot of experience. They might need to be taught some technology, but you know, we'll get there. But what do we do with them? How do we bring them back and how do we use them? Because you know, when you look at this, when you've got people living to 75, 80, 85 years old. I love to fish, but I can't fish for 25 years, eight hours a day. I gotta find something else that I wanna do. So how do we figure out how to re-engage all of them? Perhaps one of the biggest talent supply chain things that we've seen has been um, the increase in internships. Some people are doing youth apprenticeships, some are doing co-ops, but anything that digs us deep into the talent supply chain and gets people a little bit earlier. And the internship is just, you know, especially if it's college internships, if it's kids that are 20, 21, they're about ready to go. They're not, it's not like going into a middle school and trying to convince them to come work for you. These folks are about to be out. And so we have this incredible opportunity 
to go out and say, all right, you can kick the tires of us, we'll kick the tires of you, we'll figure out you know, if this thing's gonna work or not. And then we really just have the challenge of saying, okay, this was great this summer, how do we hang on to them for nine months? Because those folks will go out and they'll tell their friends, tell their colleges, hey, I got this great internship, I worked at ABC company. They become the brand ambassadors for what's going on. So as people are trying to fill that talent supply chain and go a little bit deeper, this is one of the places where an awful lot of them have gone now to say, we're gonna build our own and we're gonna start creating them into our own culture. I don't think this one's getting solved in my lifetime. Um, you know, we're arguing it at the extremes. I'm not sure we're making a whole lot of progress. And so I think a lot of companies, they still will work with the visas and do that sort of thing. But they also sort of figured out that there's a lot of US territories. And we can, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> is that your house, your, your getaway? <laughs> um, now you threw me off. So they're going to a lot of US territories. Puerto Rico was one of the most popular ones, you know, when the first hurricane came through, it's not exactly the happiest place on earth now, um, went down to try to find some people. And so you saw companies that would go down and maybe find five or six or seven people to come back and then their families would come back and then the extended families would come back and all of a sudden a construction company in Northern Minnesota has their talent supply chain where they're bringing folks back from Puerto Rico. You have states that are saying, you know, we've got to pick a territory and how do we go down and find people? How do we acclimate them to where we are? How do we get the community ready to accept them and do some different things? But 10 years ago, nobody was thinking about, hey, maybe I'll go to Puerto Rico and see if I can find a couple of people, you know, and now they are. And if you got to go somewhere, in January, it looks like as good a place as any. And, you know, I mean, if that isn't central Illinois in January, I don't know what is. <laughs> so, you know, that's how far they're willing to go. I've coached high school sports since I was 19 years old. And that has been my personal talent supply chain. So every time I'm looking for someone, I've hired, I think, six or seven people that played for me. What did I see when they were high school students playing athletics? Leadership character, ability to get along with others, work ethic, all the same stuff that I'm looking for when I'm hiring somebody. So that's my method. But all of us do something. We work you know, at our church, we're, we go on mission trips, we're at the Boys and Girls Club, we do all kinds of different things in the schools. Are we constantly looking for folks? For those of you who have kids, I mean, my God, we've all driven the caravan and you're listening, you're like, those two kids my kid is never gonna go see again. <laughs> But little Billy back there seems like a good kid. I'm gonna keep my eye on little Bill. Because you, when you watch him grow up, you see things. There's just some character issues there that you know are going to be good. So what are we doing to constantly be looking for those folks in places that might be right in front of our eyes and saying, boy, there's another one that you know, maybe we should take a look at. And then lastly, um, the whole idea of data aggregators, and I'm sure some of you have worked with them, but basically people who just take huge databases crush them together and come up with something. And they called us because we do a lot of recruiting. They said, well, maybe we can help you. Give me the sample of a job you're sometimes looking for. Okay, we're looking for machinists in Waukesha County, which is right by Milwaukee. Great, let me get back to you. Next day, I get this. Well, there's 1,393 people working as machinists in the county. They're making between 36 and $49,000, and there's almost 400 openings for them that chance you're gonna find yourself a machine. But here's the data. Now, that's all from the Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics. You wanna know where they live? Like what? You wanna know where they live? Because now we can go into the census data and combine them. And you know what? There's like 50 of them that live out in Menominee Falls. So if you're thinking of opening a new facility, I'd open it in Menominee Falls because now they don't have to make the trip to Milwaukee or wherever to work. Do you want to know what their social media feed looks like and if they're empathetic or caring? You think, what? Are they empathetic and caring? How are you going to find that out? Oh, it's really not that hard. We scrub their social media and we look for, do you go on mission trips? Do you volunteer in different clubs? Do you, you know, work at your church group? Whatever it might be. we got characteristics. We can do all that. It scares the living bejeebers out of me in terms of what's out there. But we all know it. I mean, we all know everybody knows everything about us. It's just when you actually see it that you kind of think, wow. I clicked on a box of Cocoa Krispies, I don't know, six months ago by accident. 
I was on, I don't know, it was on the Twitter feed or on my Facebook feed, hit the Cocoa Krispies. Next thing you know, you name any food group that's got more than like 100% sugar in it, I'm getting it. Getting your Pop-Tarts, I'm getting your donuts, I'm getting your whatever, I'm thinking, my God, what just happened? Three months later, we think you might have diabetes. <laughs> they know what I'm eating and they know I'm 62 years old. And they're like, all right, this guy's a prime candidate. Anyway, this is more of a science than an art now for companies that are trying to find people. It's amazing what you can dig down into if you really want to dig into it. And so that's one of the things that they're doing as well to go to try to find people. And then bonus one, um, it's an Uber world. It's actually kind of incredible. Two examples of, okay, we touched on childcare before, now we're talking about transportation. One of the groups, um, the public transportation didn't get into the neighborhood where a lot of their people were. So they said, we're just gonna send Uber through the neighborhood every morning and take you back every afternoon. That's how we're gonna get 10 of our people to work every day. Okay, get them there, it worked. Another company gave everybody, uh, in essence, a gift certificate with Uber to say, if your car doesn't start, if your spouse takes your car, if you can't get here, call Uber, they'll take you to work, we'll pay for it. Because they'd get in so many, oh, I can't make it today. Oh, okay, we're gonna take the excuse away. And we went and did it. Then you started seeing Uber hiring, warehouses, hospitals. All right, when do you wanna work? All right, I can do Tuesdays and Thursdays, but not evenings, not on odd days. I don't want it to be a holiday, it's raining. But this is when I'll come into work. And companies are taking them because 12 hours of nursing is better than no hours of work nursing. And a lot of people in nursing really burnt out, don't want the same hours, but they still have a passion to you know, deliver the service. So we'll figure it out. Warehousing, you just, we're running 24 seven. You tell me when you wanna come in, we'll figure out how to work you in. So we're again, we're accommodating people so that they know what's going on. So final thoughts, I would say, you know, for anybody who's looking to do something, almost everything that I said, you know, that's up here, you could start tomorrow if you want. to. You can go do all of these things and say, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with some of these things. We're going to get moving on this right now. We'll try to find the low hanging fruit and we'll see how many people we can start to bring in. And again, a lot of it's going to be work. A lot of it's going to be a little bit harder, but this is what it's going to take but at least maybe we can start making a dent in it right now. The bigger one is long-term because the companies that were thinking about this 20 years ago are the companies that aren't having a big problem with it right now. They were in every community college and technical college. They were in every university. They were telling stories in middle schools. They were telling stories in high schools. They were everywhere knowing that at some point they were going to need some people. And so they've been doing this for quite some time. And then they're doing the longer term things. They are looking at their benefits and saying, is this going to attract people? Is this what people are actually looking for? They're selling that quality of life. You know, you give us 40 hours, we'll give you your life back. You know, I mean, it's, it's a deal that we're striking here because the whole life, here's my life work and here's my work work. It's gone. You know, for most people, I don't get to turn it off at five o'clock and go home. So if I'm going to be basically on call, 24 hours a day, then I need some flexibility that I want to go to my kid's soccer game. I got a doctor's appointment. I got to take the dog to the vet, whatever it might be. If we can accommodate some of those things, then we're going to be in, in pretty good shape. So those are the long-term ones that people then, you know, really have to make that commitment. So if nothing else, I guess these are, these are sort of the, the big close. Um, the bottom line is this is a big deal and it's not going away. And anybody who thinks they can duck, you can't duck that long. Um, this one's here, you know, to 2090, if we believe, you know, what you saw on one of those very early slides. So we're going to have to figure out how to deal with it. And so the companies that are now figuring out where to find people, how to change their schedule, they're the ones that are beginning to, to figure everything out. I said to Andy before I started, I said, you know, I think patience is going to be the soft skill of the 2020s. Because I'm doing my own... I'm doing my own grocery bagging now because I go nuts watching some of those people. I'm just like, I can't, just give me the bag. I'll put my stuff in there. <laughs> Waiting in line, going to a restaurant and seeing half of it not being able to be served because I don't have enough people. We were chuckling when they were turning over the room here. You got about four people trying to turn over 80 tables because 
hey, we only got four people. So all of those things are going to be happening now. All talents not equal. And this is a killer for the people compensation because they're used to, here are our tracks, here's our categories, here's our numbers. It doesn't work anymore. Because all of a sudden seven people just walked out the door. I don't care what your salary schedule tells me. They're getting more money someplace else. We got to make an adjustment. Everybody budgeted this year for 3% pay increases with inflation at 6% and, and cost or inflation at 7%, cost of living at 6%. Here's your 3%. Mm. That doesn't make people feel very good. So now they're all trying to figure out where are we going to find additional money. So we've got to figure out how to hang on to the talent that we've got. And all people aren't created equal. There are jobs that we got to hang on to folks or this place shuts down. So we might have to make some accommodations. And then lastly, if you've got good people, I don't care what happens in your organization, you got to hang on to them because they are invaluable. You're not going to be able to replace them. And so folks are figuring out how do we redeploy people within the organization so we're getting So the chart that I gave you at the beginning kind of told it all. I guess I could have quit after 15 seconds. Um, but that's sort of what's going on out there. That's what some of our companies are doing. Um, if you need anything from me, um, the Twitter stuff is up there. My email is up there. I'm happy to have a conversation with anybody and I'll stick around for a little bit afterwards. Andy, I don't know if you want to do questions or we, we started late now we're behind schedule. So. Okay, you got them there or you want me to ask out here? All right, ooh, this is Jeopardy. So, can we? Where's the traveling mic? You got the, right there in the center. Okay. All right. So, Jim, thank you again. Um, when we warned everybody we'd be talking about the future of work, I, I didn't think we were going to go. It was awesome. Um, <laughs> definitely uh, mind blowing and eye opening. I do have a couple of questions that came in through the chat. Um, is the Deloitte data that you shared, is that gathered um, with upon, they use the term, upon a pandemic advance? The Deloitte data gave, I'm sorry, the Deloitte data gathered upon was, oh, is the it Deloitte? Deloitte the yes. Example, that was before pandemic. Before yes. pre-pandemic, okay. Yep. All right, sorry, that was how it was worded in there. <laughs> All right, and do we have uh, the traveling mic? Any questions for Jim? There's stuff. Oh. I want to still. I want to know what happened to the Puerto Rico slide game. <laughs> well, I happen in Puerto Rican. So <laughs> okay, perfect. By the way, Quincy, the city of Quincy in Illinois. Is everybody here from? Yes. So they actually right. I came to Puerto Rico to bring folks, and actually. I know there's folks from Area 26, their community colleges, their, their teams actually recruit players from Puerto Rico. And they love that part of the state so much that some of the families have been moving into that part of uh, Southern Illinois. But my question is, where does automation fit into all of this? Because you know we're looking at driver, driverless trucks. You know, You go to any grocery store, you know, you can self-serve. So where do you see the role of automation playing in this whole scenario? That's a really good question. I mean, basically, if you can't find people, you sort of have three choices. You move somewhere else where there are people, you automate, or you stop doing what you're doing. And, you know, the automation thing, everybody wants to do it. Um, it's not cheap in most connections. Now, finally, getting to a point where there may not be any other choice. And so I think you're going to see a lot more of the automation starting to happen because otherwise people are going where the folks are, which is going to be Texas and well, Kelly, yeah, but who knows there. Um, I just think you're going to start seeing more of it. Some of it might be simplified. Um, and then you just have a different problem then. Then you need a whole bunch of people who know technology and can fix automation. And so you got a different set of skills that you now have to begin to develop. But, you know, with the bigger companies you're seeing, if you've ever been in an Amazon warehouse, my goodness. Um, you're starting to see the human um, robots. 
and the semi-human robots where a human still directs the robot, but for safety purposes, lifting purposes, accuracy, there's a human robot thing, but especially here in the upper Midwest, I think there's a lot of, well, I mean, McDonald's, I mean, there are, we have a whole bunch of McDonald's where I am where there aren't people taking cash register anymore. You go to a kiosk and McDonald's has already experimented with people free McDonald's. So I, I mean, I, I think it's just gonna happen. And now that, you know, everybody was worried seven and a quarter minimum wage, that doesn't exist anymore because everybody's at 18, $19. So now there's a real pay pressure to, to move. So I guess long, long after start, I just think you're gonna start seeing it pop up just about everywhere. We have time for one more. Uh, Sarah is right behind you with the microphone, or we'll take two more. How about that? Okay, he was, two more. He was talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We can do two more. <laughs> My name is Adam Flack. I'm a lifelong Midwesterner, um, but I, I wanted to ask about. You spoke about the. Uh, 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 employers creating incentives or making their new employees feel welcome. I recently sat in on a, a, a round table with a bunch of manufacturers indicating that they had created incentives and tried to change some of their work schedules to accommodate some of the newer employees coming in. Um, but they still lost some of those new employees. So can you speak a little bit about where it where the line between making them feel cared about and actually making them have to work kind of comes into play. That didn't sound like Midwestern nice to me. <laughs> um, I don't know where that line is. Um, you know, on one hand, I will defend them that their lifestyle has been different. Um, my kids have driven our family since the day they were born. They decided where do we go on vacation what sports are we going to play when are we going to play them when are we going to go they're in charge of stuff and if you want to blame anybody you don't blame us and so there is a little bit of an i don't want, entitlement is a, is a bad word but there's an expectation here that i'm going to kind of be care of and i think, think that's too far flip side i need the people and so how far am i willing to go to accommodate someone in order to get them to stay and Every company's drawn the line where they think they know. Some of them aren't tolerating any of it. And they're having a hard time getting anybody in the door and others create their own problems by just sort of letting everybody do their own thing. So I don't know where that, that magic line is other than I'm running a company, I gotta get a product out the door and I need this many people to do it. So what do I have to do in order to make that happen? I know it's not a great answer for you, but I think every company is they're just still feeling their way because they've never had to do this before. Do you have the other one? Yeah, so um, my question is about baby boomers and millennials uh, fighting. So I read an article that said that millennials are mad at baby boomers because one, they're not selling their house, two, they're not um, quitting their jobs. And I look around here and I don't want to tell on anybody, but there are a lot of baby boomers in this room because I've worked with them for a lot of years. And um, so my question, I read that baby boomers haven't been quitting at the numbers, even with the pandemic. They, you know, as it was anticipated, we're working much longer in, in general. So what's your thought on that? And two, that millennials are more willing to shape their work around their lives than as we did our lives around our work. Yes. You want more than that? Or? <laughs> okay, I'm a, I'm a boomer that's a, a, a millennial at heart. So, um, you know, I think a lot of the boomers are getting out in the higher numbers, but a lot of them are sticking around way. I, mean, I think it's way, it's balancing out that some, every, if everybody had gone at 65, this would be great. Well, a whole bunch went at 55, but this group's hanging on to 85. So I think that that's true. Um, and the housing thing, depending on the market, I think it's just an economic deal where it's like, okay, I'll go sell my house for $500,000, but now I can't find a condo for less than $600,000. So I'm gonna hang on to my house. And I don't know what you go and do about that. I think that's, that's a little bit of whining. Um, I, but I do, I give the, I've had so many 
baby boomer supervisors come up to me and say, these rotten stinking kids, you know, they're not doing what I'm telling them to and whatever. And like nine times out of 10, the reason they're not doing what I'm telling them to is because we haven't explained to why they need to do it. And they want to know why. And I think at all my coaching, somebody said very early on, if you're ever running a drill or doing something and a player says, why are we doing this? And you can't answer the question, you know, shame on you. And almost every example they've given me, I said, well, you know, they're not putting the this back where the this is supposed to be. So no, rot. why don't they do it? I said, well, why do they need to do that? Well, because by state law, we have to have this here. Okay, have you told them that? No, why don't you tell them that? I'll bet you they'll put the piece of paper back in the damn folder. <laughs> Um, you know, so I think a lot of us, we sort of did what we were told, which was a wonderful characteristic, but it also was the blind leading the blind. Like you told me to go there. I went, you know, or sister Felicia would hit me with a ruler. So I'm like, I'm, I'm going, but they want to know why. And I think a lot of the, this wasn't in your question, but it's what I've heard the most is the disruption between the two in terms of how they look at work, how they look at play. I got, I got a whole bunch of people are texting me at three o'clock in the morning because they finished a project. I'm not responding, but I know they're working, so good for them. And they all want my cell phone number because the only way they want to communicate is via text. I don't want to give anybody my cell phone number. All right, well, do I want to get a hold of them or do I not want to get a hold of them? That goes back to you know your question. It's like, how much do you want to give up to, to make it happen? So I don't know. Every generation fights with the one that, you know, but I know, you know, the boomers caused it all. So thank you, Jim Morgan. Thanks very much. Yeah, my pleasure. I want to create a feedback loop that we all can love. When I say thank, you say you. Thank. Thank you so much for your patience with the feedback loop that was more <laughs> than we wanted it to be. And um, but we really appreciate that you all stuck around and wasn't get were engaged. We're using the Hoover, which I think is such a cool name. Um, we uh, would like to uh, just also um, thank all of our presenters, speakers. Uh, our energy and time today, our leader, I mean, really, we have a great leadership team here within the state of Illinois. Thank you. Tomorrow, how about today? Today, today, the Advancing Equity in Illinois Workforce System is now here. So you are here if you're going to the Advancing Equity in Illinois Workforce System, okay? And let's talk about tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah. All right, tomorrow we're going to wrap up. I mean, we're going to be starting at eight morning and at central time. Um, but you also are welcome to join us for breakfast at 7, 7.30 in the morning. So again, thank you so, 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 so much um, for um, an awesome session for, you know, we couldn't have a great conference or a summit without people who, um, so I'm Renee Patrick. I'm the director of Title IV, Division of Rehab Services. And I really, really appreciate all of you for coming. Have a great night. Unless you're going to the equity in Illinois workforce system.